Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. Welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. We're here for another edition of the show. I've got Silwan, right? Silwan. Or Sil. Bradford <laughs> from St. Trifon, not Trifon, uh, winery here. Uh, we're kind of between Sisterdale and Bernie. Uh, Seven miles north of Bernie, about five miles south of uh, uh, Sisterdale. Yeah. So we're out here in the Hill Country, Texas. Um, Sil and I have been following each other for about a year or so on social media, and I got to meet him at the uh, the uh, Hill Country Wine Symposium a few weeks ago, and I reached out to him uh, last week to see if I can come do some interviews uh, in the Hill Country. He was one of the people that said, yes, come on by. So I'm real excited about being here. Um, it's a brand new winery. I'm excited about trying some wine here and, and finding out the story, what's going on. And uh, so without further ado, so kind of introduce yourself. Well, um, thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, as you said, my name is uh, Silwan Bradford. Um, I'm the owner and winemaker of St. Trifon Farm and Vineyards. As Mark said, we're a very new winery. Opened up, actually it'll be one year uh, tomorrow, is our one year anniversary. We opened up on the feast day of St. Trifon. Uh, St. Trifon is the patron saint of grape growers and gardeners, hunters and horses. Mm -hmm. um, we are avid fans of all those things, most notably wine and horses. Okay. Um, and in naming our winery, we wanted to honor uh, something besides ourselves with our name. Um, so uh, we uh, we launched a year ago, and um, it's it's been a, a fantastic first year. Um, and uh, yeah, all right, very nice. So what what drove you to do this? You you told me you were in distribution before. So what what made you do this crazy thing of Starting a winery. So, um, yeah, crazy. In a lot of ways, I, had, I, I did not foresee. But um, uh, as you mentioned, I, I, I uh, spent 12 years uh, in the, well, 11 years in the distribution world. I worked in retail for uh, one year in the wine business. Uh, mm -hmm. My first job out of college was with HEB as a wine steward. Okay. Um, and um, really, my love affair with wine began uh, during college on a road trip. Uh, some friends of mine and I took to California. We went um, uh, out to San Francisco, and we were poor college boys, so we were looking for free places to stay. And it happened to this girl that I liked out there named Helen Kongsgaard, who, um, who lived in Napa. I knew Napa was close to San Francisco, close enough for us to maybe stay there. So I called her up and ended up crashing at her place. Um, and uh, we roll in, bunch of dirty, road-weary college boys at like nine o'clock, and her father's making these beautiful steaks, her mom is making these sides, Helen and her brother are making desserts, and Wagner's playing in the background. <laughs> we sit down at the table, and we have this insanely beautiful wine, which comes out, turned out to be Kongsgaard uh, Chardonnay. Um, Let's say, is we're talking yeah, actual so, Kongsgaard? Yeah, 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 so he had, if I, if I remember right, he had just left Newton, where he had created uh, Newton Unfiltered Chardonnay, mm -hmm. um, and then was launching his um, self-named uh, brand. So I not really ever had wine, so my first experience with wine happened to be a Kongsgaard Chardonnay, which is pretty freaking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, so after that, wine became kind of an accessory hobby in my personal life, and then uh, my wife and I met in 2006. I was on my way to get my PhD in literature and decided that uh, my first year of marriage, I did not want to go into a lot of debt. So wine had become enough of a hobby that I thought, you know, what the heck, I'll uh, pursue the wine world and uh, got into wine. And wine hit on enough intellectual aspects to keep it really fascinating for me. It's art, it's science, it's new every year. Um, and I've always loved to garden and loved to farm. And so uh, once I was in, I was bit by, by it and uh, I've been in it ever since. So uh, I was in retail, as I mentioned for a year, roughly a year and a half, uh, followed by uh, fine wine uh, sales and then uh, management. Um, and, you know, have a good opportunity of traveling, you know, all over the world, Bordeaux and Italy, and of course, Washington, and Oregon, California and such. Right. Um, 
and uh, always kept my eye on what was going on in the Texas scene. And um, I was always judging Texas wines, of which we carried quite a few, against their counterparts in in the world. And um, it was really about eight years ago when I saw people planting grapes that to me made sense. So, you know, Dr. Bob at Bending Ranch and Tanat, William Chris and Chris Brundrick and Bill Blackman with uh, Muvedra, uh, Dukeman with Ayanico. Mm -hmm. When that started happening, I'm like, well, this is what we should be doing. I mean, looking at it as a wine guy, not as a particularly a Texas wine consumer, but as right. a wine guy thinking to himself, if we were to do this, on a real global level and really make wines that compete globally, should we be doing Cabernet and Merlot and Saint Blanc and Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, or should we be focused on Mouvedre and Tanat and et cetera? And so when I saw that happen and then got to know some of the growers up in the High Plains, um, I really saw how serious um, uh, the Texas wine scene was becoming um, and wanted to be a part of it. Um, so. Uh, in 2013, my wife and I purchased this property. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't look anything like it looks now. Um, I took cuttings from a friend's vineyard in um, uh, 14 and 15, Louis Dixon of La Cruz de Comel. Uh, so all my Blanc de Bois front are cuttings from his vineyard, and then okay. uh, Black Spanish in the back are all cuttings from his vineyard as well. Um, and then we uh, ripped the field in 16, high fenced in 16, uh, started making great purchases from the high plains in 16. So that we could start making wine in 16, so right. that we could open up February of last year. Yeah. Well, yeah, because you know you, you got to start making wine at some point. <laughs> a, yeah, I mean, that's kind of an important part of this whole thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. You said that you actually got a harvest out of the vineyards here on the property last year. Yeah. So we, in 2018, we got our first harvest. Very okay. small um, harvest, but uh, we made a sparkling wine, uh, which will go to just the wine club. Only, uh, okay. Such a small harvest, and then with the black Spanish. Um, it will, we're going to do a multi-vintage, so non-vintage uh, port project. It's it's stellar right now. I'm super happy with it. But again, small first harvest, so okay. uh, that'll, that'll be in under years before that's released. Okay. Um, so uh, while I was uh, hanging out, because uh, I got here kind of early, um, so I was taking as much of a look at the vineyards as I could from the car. Um, what type of vineyard practices are you doing? I saw some cover crop in there. So are you trying to do some types of sustainable uh, type of thing or? Yeah. Well, I know it can be a challenge here in the Hill Country with trying to do anything organic or biodynamic. Sure. Um, so um, yes and no. I, mean, we, I would definitely feel comfortable using the word sustainable. I wouldn't be comfortable using the word organic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our spray protocol, which you know, we implement once, but we have bud break in early part of the season, you know, is primarily sulfur, copper sulfate, uh, styled oil. Um, those have been our primary uh, tools um, in our kit to, to keep uh, downy mildew, powdery mildew uh, at, at bay. Um, uh, we do aggressively cover crop. Uh, right now we've got um, a cover crop of oats and ryegrass and okay. some radishes. Um, radishes are fantastic at opening the soil up. Um, um, <clears throat> so we have uh, used some synthetic uh, sprays if, if needed. Um, most notably, um, we have a lot of Bermuda grass in the vineyard. Okay. And uh, since the vines are so young, Bermuda grass propagates both above ground by seed and underground by rhizome. And uh, every time you dig up a little Bermuda grass, you're basically planting another seed, so you're propagating okay. it. So our first year we sprayed nothing uh, and we hand hoed, hand weeded, weed eated, um, and you know, basically turned out that we were making a bad problem worse by uh, you know, doing this organically. So we've made a couple adjustments there. Our goal is to get that under control so that we can um, move back to that. But um, to use the word sustainable, hand weeding, hand hoeing, <laughs> times a year was not sustainable. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, you got horses. You using the horse to, to plow? No, no, not yeah, not yeah, that'd be crazy. No, I mean it's it's kind of there. We wanna we want to. Um, Add uh, a sheep component, but okay. again, we've we so we planted most of the vineyard in 16. We had to supplement some vines in uh, 17, and there's gonna be a little bit more to fill in some holes in 18, or I'm sorry, 19. Uh, and so once the vines are, are the size where we can utilize sheep, we want to uh, use that as a protocol. We're called St. Tree Farm, Farm and Vineyards because our goal is to look at this entire property and project really as a um, 
a holistic entity. And okay. So, you know, between the chickens and ducks and sheep and horses, I mean, we compost all the horse manure. We spread that every uh, two years uh, in the vineyard. Um, and, and so as we grow, our goal is to just more and more achieve kind of the vision that Farm of Vineyards puts out there for okay. us. Okay. So why did you choose the two grapes you chose to grow here? Is that are they better suited for the hill country's point of view, your specific climate here? Um, well, there is some natural uh, tolerance and resistance to some of the mildews that, you know, it's, it's not as humid here in the hill country as it is in Houston, but mm -hmm. 40, 50, 60% humidity is humid to a grape. You yeah. know, it's not as humid to us, uh, but to a great, that's pretty, pretty humid. So we do fight uh, with those. But most, the main reason why we planted um, uh, Black Spanish and Blanc de Bois was because um, they're resistant naturally to Pierce's disease, okay. which is a, a, a soil-borne uh, pathogen that's uh, carried by a glassy and sharpshooter that uh, can decimate a vineyard in no short order unless you're using um, certain chemicals that are systemic. Right. And being that our fundamental goal is to be as sustainable and as organic and as clean as possible, our starting point was to use varietals that didn't have to be in life support, basically. Okay. Um, yeah, I was talking with... Um, what was, what was his name? He has the he has the winery out by Seguin. Um, Blue? No. I can't, remember, I can't remember the name of his winery, but he, he was talking about having some issues with Pierce's disease. Mm -hmm. so it's out here. Yeah. You know, we've been lucky the last few years, but um, uh, it hasn't been as big of an issue. But um, it's, it hasn't gone away. There's no right. like, cure for it. And the natural resistance of varietals like Black Spanish and uh, Blanc de Bois. And I think they're compelling varietals, and I think, frankly, they're interesting. Okay, you yeah. Know, they're, um, you know, there's a renaissance in American kind of viticulture and grape culture that, you know, people have drank Cabernet and Merlot and such for years, and now every state in the country is making wine. And, you know, the grapes that are either native to certain regions uh, are really a compelling viticultural story for a right. state. And uh, I think there's something really interesting in embracing those uh, and in, even embracing them in their oddity. And Black Spanish is a, it's a different varietal. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has some characteristics that, um, you know, some people aren't big fans of. I, I find the, the, the fact that it retains such great natural acidity, even when it's really hot, um, is one of its fantastic, fantastic selling points because in the hill country, we have a hard time um, uh, achieving ripeness and maintaining natural acidity in, yeah. in the grapes. And Black Spanish does a really great job of that naturally. Okay. And so now you also have some uh, uh, contracts out with some uh, growers out in the High Plains? Correct. Okay. Um, what, what other varieties are we talking about now? So our leading varietal is New Bedroom. Okay. That's what um, I'm biggest champion of uh, in Texas. Uh, it and Alianico were planted by two favorite varietals, followed by Tanat and Tempranillo. Um, so our our main grower is uh, Farmhouse Vineyards, which I'm representing with yeah. some I remember, Jane, I, I remember seeing them out there uh, yeah, at the symposium, yeah. Yeah, yeah great family. I love, love all of them, Anthony, Nick, Tracy. I actually hung out a couple of them on one of the nights eating. Yeah, Whataburger. Eating, eating Whataburger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whataburger, yeah. yeah. Eating Whataburger in, uh, in, in, in cinnamon rolls. <laughs> yeah. And, and my, my belly got a little bit more big. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had it reined in this last couple of weeks, <laughs> but um, yeah, that was that was kind of fun to, to meet some of them up there. Yeah. So they're really a cool a cool grower. Um, they're uh, they're not organic uh, grape growers. However, they're uh, they do have a certified organic cotton and peanut production. Okay, uh, and so although they're not certified organic in their grape production, they bring all that kind of knowledge and know-how um, that they apply to their other crops uh, too. So, I mean, I, they, I, they, they farm just very, very cleanly. And since we're doing a lot of wild fermentations on our um, wines and trying to minimize, or in some cases not use sulfur at all, um, really the starting point for us is, is vineyard and making sure mm -hmm. that the vineyard. So, you know, Katie Jane and the Farmhouse Vineyards are really our, our main uh, grower for, for that uh, reason. Um, and then uh, also, Newsom, uh, Neil Newsom. Um, yeah, I got to meet him too. Yeah, uh, fantastic human being. His, he and his wife Janice are just just beautiful people, and we're super honored, uh, especially at this early stage in our uh, wine, to be uh, working with them. So right now, uh, Tanat and uh, Tempranillo and Alvarino uh, okay. are varietals that we are uh, getting from him, and then. Uh, 
with Ionico from uh, VJ Ready, and um, and then uh, in 2019, uh, the Phillips family, Phillips Vineyard, um, will uh, be purchasing some since so. Uh, okay. From them for rosé and a dry red. Very cool. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, your winemaking itself. Um, so uh, are you, how should I ask all these questions? So obviously we work with grapes can be crushed and press and all that. Um, are you doing um, a lot of uh, skin contact with with uh, with your reds? Uh, are you doing anything like that with any any maceration with white wines, like trying to do a type of orange wine type of thing? Mm -hmm. um, um, I guess it's kind of walk me through maybe your, your wine making steps with mm -hmm. maybe your varietals. Um, so um, uh, since Mouvedre is our main varietal, and, um, uh, but you know every varietal we kind of take uh, a somewhat different approach. Um, mm -hmm. You know Tempranillo we treat very differently than Mouvedre. Tempranillo uh, after fermentation is finished. I, I like for it to have an extended kind of post fermentation maceration time, uh, okay. uh, which uh, I think really um, kind of. Um, not intensifies, but kind of balances the natural tannins, and um, I, get, I think it gives them some elegance. Uh, whereas Mouvedre, we, we we don't do that. But uh, okay. with Mouved, you know, we're, we're aiming to pick uh, at optimal ripeness and uh, picking for natural acidity. So I'd rather have acidity um, rather than to really push the envelope on ripeness and have acidity kind of fall by the wayside. Right. So that way acidity too many adjustments in, in exactly. the yeah. so, um, Really, we try not to do any. Uh, we do if we have to, but right. um, in Mouvedre, we've been very lucky we, not to have. I mean, 16 um, wild fermentation kicked off in about eight days. Uh, it was a, a slow cool fermentation, open top uh, from fermenting uh, uh, containers, um, uh, and uh, fermentation uh, took about three weeks to, to go completely dry. And we um, in sixteen we didn't even inoculate mallow, which is kind of risky. And in, in seventeen and eighteen we have inoculated mallow, so we're you know letting it feral ferment or wild ferment uh, on its for primary fermentation, but for malolactic fermentation we're uh, inoculating. Uh, okay, uh, and that's just it's safer and just make sure it actually goes through that right. process. And there's nothing wrong with it. No, no. <laughs> I, I, um, yeah, I certainly don't put myself in like the natural wine making category. I like to be minimalistic in our approach, but certainly our goal is to make great wine. Period. Right. Not not. Put ideology over, um, you know, practical practical fact. That wine needs to be really good. I mean, that's the whole point. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah. So uh, Moon um, in sixteen and seventeen, um, we have not uh, used sulfur uh, even at bottling. In eighteen, we we have used a little bit of sulfur during. Um, actually, we just yesterday uh, at a very small but so our, again our, our goal is to make really great wine and do so with as little intervention as possible okay and uh, as far as uh, oak aging uh, do you have like a mixture of new used sure never stuff? never american oak always either neutral barrels so barrels that have been used you know six seven or whatever for you know times previously uh and then some new french oak okay so that's kind of our i you know i i um I don't think Texas fruit, uh, by and large, holds up to a whole lot of uh, oak regimen, uh, new oak regimen. Uh, and frankly, you know, wine is grape juice, and I like for the wine to taste fresh and vivacious um, and fruity. Um, and, uh, I, and and then the consumers kind of palate is moving in that direction anyway. You know, the over oaked Chardonnays, a big over oaked powerful Napa Cavs. People are liking wines, you know, concrete is a thing. People all over the world are going back to aging in carboys, which is kind of <laughs> funny. Um, so, you know, part of that is a stylistic choice of, you know, making wine that I like, because uh, if it doesn't sell, I don't want to drink it. Um, <laughs> there you go, right? If <laughs> um, it doesn't sell, yeah, yeah, it, it tastes, like, like, tastes horrible. Why would you want to drink it, right? Not, yeah. It's not my thing, so ultimately I'm making wine for me. Um, and I hope everyone else likes it. But um, yeah, that's kind of our, our approach. So if we do use French oak, um, uh, it's just kind of a background component, uh, you know, just a spice box kind yeah. of in the background. Yeah. It's kind of like being a musician. I mean, if you don't like your sound music, why are you playing it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Well, um, you pour some wine here. So what, what do we have here? Uh, so this is 100% uh, Alianico uh, from 2016. <laughs> um, 
Uh, right now, we have three red wines in our uh, portfolio. Uh, we sold out in 2016, Nuvedra 2016 Syrah. Um, we actually made two Tempranillos our first year. Um, but in any case, uh, the reason why I opened this, so we've got right now uh, Tempranillo, Alianico, and Tanat. And of those three, for drinking right now, this is my favorite. Um, cool. I thought maybe you had overheard I like Alianico a lot. Huh? I didn't, know, but I'm, I'm pleased because I think it's a, it's a great... That's why I give the thumbs up. I'm like, yes. It's a great grape, both as a single varietal. And I, there's only a few other wineries, I think, that are doing a single varietal uh, wines with it. Um, but uh, again, I give massive props to Dukeman for yes, bringing this grape to, um, to Texas. Um, uh, you know, de great density of fruit, great uh, grape tannins, um, cool kind of spice box components. Um, it's, it's, it's a rich wine, but I'd say kind of medium to full bodied, it's certainly not full bodied, um, and um, really great, beautiful acidity um, and good color. Very cool. Well, let's let's check it out. Now, I my, had my uh, I sat down with my, my mentor Craig Collins, who long time viewers show know I interviewed him way back in the day, and I didn't do so hot on my on my tasting, and he was like, "You swirled with the wine way too much." And I was like, oh, really? "Oh, okay." And he also pointed out that as I'm just sitting there like talking, I'm just swirl, swirl, swirl. I said, "Well, that's what I do on the show too." Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, not a nervous habit; it's just a habit. So he told me at first, nothing you can't swirl. He's like, just smell it first. I'm like, okay. Especially the white wines. The white wines, I just, I was blown off all the esters. It's a really like, uh, yeah, some really I'm, nice I'm, I'm red fruit. So, yes, yeah, wishing is probably not a good idea. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you can. Absolutely, you need to. No, I mean, when being mic'd, I just, oh, yeah. I just thought about that. Oh, I, 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 I swish, yeah. swirl, and slurp, and they, they hear it all. So, it's okay. But some really nice red fruit on here. Um, really has to get some like strawberry and uh, a little bit of cranberry on that too, mm -hmm. you know. And you you don't there's not a, a ton of oak coming through, which is great, you know. There's there's a there's a little bit of that, a touch of vanilla, a touch of the sure, but, but it's kind of there. It's not it's a nuance yeah. kind of background component, certainly not overwhelming. Really good on the tan in there. The red fruits are coming through. Um, get a little more black fruit too, a little blackberry. Um, the spice component, spice component is like just, it's just like a seasoning. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you had just enough salt and pepper, you know, in, in the dish mm -hmm. to just to, to elevate things, to, to bring out, to bring out the, the flavors of it. Um, you know, and definitely some good tan on this. I mean, you, not that, not that I would never crush a bottle without food, but this is definitely something that you want to have something, uh, and that's something I, with, you know, I, that's really, um, I would say another thing about most of our wines is that they're really meant to be picking for as acidity mainly. And, um, they're, they're fantastic, uh, in relationship to, to food. Mm -hmm. It's really a, a style that we're looking for. Yeah, a really good charcuterie, um, or just if you want to go down the path, some, some great pasta, mm -hmm. some great Italian food, a great ribeye, um, that type of stuff, mm -hmm. you know. That, that will help. I mean, the acid's there, the tannin's there, especially with the tannin, you know, uh, having that interaction. Mm -hmm. um, it's delicious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's absolutely mm -hmm. delicious. Um, and, you know, it, it reinforces my love of, of a grape I don't drink enough of. Uh, and I think the style of Ionico here in Texas and um, versus uh, its homeland in Campania, the Slocata, and, and Puglia, um, I think it's, um, it's you know, we're not growing this on the volcanic soils that it's largely grown there in right. Italy. Um, and so I think we had, it's, a, it's a very different, and I think more approachable in its youth here in Texas, whereas the wines of Ionico del Voltor and, and, and such in, in Italy, man, they can be hard yes. for a while. I mean, it's called the Barolo of the South for a reason um, in, in Italy because it, it can be challenging to, you know, be graceful in its youth. But I think here in Texas, the wines, um, I mean, I think this is very open texture and very lovely and very fresh right now. Right, yeah. We, you don't need to lay it down for 10 years no. to, to make a drink of it. Right. No, I think it's, it's wonderful. 
Uh, what's what's the retail on this here? At 36. 36, that's a good price. You know, um, that, that's nice. I like that. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I really want to ask you about. I mean, we talked about your winemaking, talked about the vineyards, talked about the history. Um, wow. And, and I know you have an appointment here pretty soon. <laughs> I do. Yeah, but if there's anything else, I'm, I'm here. Um, is there anything that you think we should talk about? Like you, we haven't mentioned that, that you really want to... Um, <clears throat> Well, uh, you know, I always like, I do like to tell the story of St. Trifon. Yeah, uh, we, have, we, have, we just kind of just briefly right, mentioned yeah. that. So, I mean, I, I mentioned he's the patron saint of grape growers and gardeners, hunters and horses. Yeah. He's a third century um, Christian uh, martyr, martyred um, under Emperor Decius when he was the ripe old age of 16. Oh my goodness. Um, he was known from his youth as being able to heal both people and animals. And so back in the day, he was called the men mercenary healer or someone who was a doctor basically for free uh, in charge of people. Uh, known to have sent back plagues of locusts and other, you know, pests from fields um, and vineyards, thus his tie to agriculture. Um, and he was a tender of geese. And that's kind of all that's known about the Saint Trifon. Um, okay. And then and that's again, third century. And then you flash forward to the time of Ivan the Terrible in Russia, and there's a Trifon who's named after Saint Trifon. So his patron saint is Saint Trifon. And um, this Trifon was uh, Ivan the Terrible's hunting lackey. And they're out on a hunt one day, and Ivan loses his best hunting falcon, and of course doesn't blame it on himself, but blames it on Saint, or blames it on Trifon, okay. and uh, uh, tells Trifon that um, unless he finds his best falcon in three days, he's going to be uh, executed. Uh, Trifon, That's terrible. Yeah. Pretty I mean. <laughs> And, uh, Sorry. So uh, three days go by, or two days, something like that, and uh, Trifon has no success. Uh, he falls on his knees outside of some Russian forest and implores his patron saint, Saint Trifon, please help me find this bird, I don't want to die. Um, Trifon appears to him in a vision on horseback with the falcon in his hand. Hmm. Uh, says upon waking, you'll, uh, you'll find this, um, this bird in an adjacent pine tree. It happens as such. He returns the uh, bird to Ivan, his life is saved. And uh, so those two stories have kind of emerged historically. Uh, I don't know if you could turn the camera to see the painting of St. Trifon, but- uh, I'll get some pictures of it. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, throw, um, we'll throw it into the video. Yeah. So St. Trifon is often depicted on horseback. Okay. It has a 16 year old, but with a bird in hand. Sometimes okay. a falcon, sometimes um, a dove. Um, and uh, so when we pick the name, then the next step was obviously to, to design a label and, and such. And uh, so we commissioned a, a friend of ours, a really famous artist in Southern California. She's ethnic Korean, raised in Japan. Her name is Remy Yang. We commissioned her to do a painting of St. Trifon. Um, and she ended up doing three paintings because she loved the project so much. And then we okay. got to pick the one that we liked the, the most, which is this painting, which I'll show uh, your, your viewers. Uh, and then that's where our, our label and our logo of the bird of hand okay. uh, image comes from, which you see all over our media. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and then uh, I just I also noticed, I think, because there's only no flowers on there, but it looked like you have some rose bushes at the end of the... At the, end of the we do. The, yeah, the vines kind of tell me the... Tell us the story yeah, behind they, that. They, they, well, they're pretty. It's, it's um, pretty, yeah. I know it's more of a folklore than necessarily being actual. Right? You know, I, I, I've, I've out there, you know, checking it. They, they should show signs of uh, mildew and black rot uh, prior to vines. So, you know, if you're going to have an issue with, um, you know, some mildew pressure or rot pressure, Theoretically, yeah. <laughs> uh, the great the the rose bushes will show it um, prior. Um, but in reality, I haven't <laughs> seen that to be necessarily true. Maybe I'm not looking closely enough. I don't know, but um, uh, they're also just aesthetically nice. So. Yeah. When we were we were hanging out there, I was telling you know, Dad's over there by the way. Um, I was telling like, I was like, well, those vineyards like. You know, I don't know if he's pruned and all that stuff and blah, blah, blah. So I don't know. I, I can't look at vineyards at this, at this. well, I can't look at vineyards really at any point in time in the season to know exactly what's going on. I mean, other than there's leaves and there's variation may have happened. But mm -hmm. like this time of year, I don't really visit 
mm-hmm. any wineries, at least I don't go in the vineyards. Sure. Um, but I was like, so he's got some cover crop and he's got this. I said, let's say it's rose bushes. I said, you remember that? He goes, what is that for? I said, well, I didn't remember the exact, I just knew something about disease. And, mm-hmm. and I said, you remember we saw that in California? He goes, no. And I explained it. He goes, oh yeah, I kind of remember that. I said, they also look pretty. Yeah. <laughs> that's what, that's what they, I think it was that plump jack I asked them. I asked him the plump jack and he said, he gave me like basically the same thing. I was like, they're, they're really just aesthetics, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, yeah, they have some, they have some purpose, but you know, in case somebody comes up here, then they can see that you have that. So I wanted to like, you know, have sure. a little. Yeah, so we pre-pruned, we, we did a, a preliminary pruning in um, December. Okay. Uh, and that's just to get rid of kind of the, you know, vines are super aggressive and you know, you can have shoots out there that are 12 feet long. So we pre-pruned just to kind of get everything back into the trellis wires and mm-hmm. man, more manageable. And then we'll do a final pruning here, we'll probably starting in about a month. Okay, uh, yeah. And, you know, we'll, you know, we don't want to touch anything right now because with these relatively warmer temperatures, yeah, we were talking about that. that. Yeah, will exacerbate or really, um, it'll it, it pushes the plant forward and it's it's desire to to get going for the season. And right, we yeah. don't want that right now because we've got uh, February, March, and half of April to get through before uh, you know. Right, you don't want to have anything starting too early because right. then you, it, 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 it introduces a whole bunch of new set of problems you don't want to deal with. So she get a frost or anything like that. Um, you know, we don't want Chicago weather right now. Which see, so this this episode is going to come out about a month from now because I've got two. I've got I've got got uh, got uh, Sergio's interview cocktail conference and then two interviews. So yeah. So mm-hmm. by the time you all see this, it'll be it will be February. Um, but yeah, we don't want, yeah, so we, we don't want January Chicago weather, you know, or, or Midwest right now, but you know, if it got cooler, and just a little than it is right now, yeah. we've only really had, you know, we've had one really good freeze, which was in November, which really kind of came early because mm-hmm. it was warm, really yeah. warm up until then. And also we had a 26 degree day, which also is not good for the vines because they need to go into dormancy, um, you know, quietly, right, uh, yeah. not dramatically. Um, and then relatively since then, it's been it's been on the warmer side of things. We've had some really warm yeah. 32, but it hasn't been, we haven't had a stretch yet of real cold weather, um, but maybe February would be a little different. Yeah, my 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 feeling, not, no, I'm not trying to be all like Nostradamus, but my feeling in past years, it always seems like February is the coldest of the months. Not, totally not, not that we guys don't get cold like in December and January, but it feels like February is really the month where we actually get the cold. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's right. And um, I, I always feel, feel like January is kind of this little teaser, like teaser spring. And it's like, yeah, February yeah. comes along. It's like, yeah, it's not happening. Yeah. I and mean, we've had plenty of times in Texas where it's, you know, 30 degrees on Christmas Eve and 75 degrees on Christmas Day. Mm-hmm. So December is yeah. a crazy month for us. And it really is. So, um, well, so um, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, I do appreciate you spending some time with me. Oh, my uh, pleasure. Be able to taste your wine finally, um, and I hope to come out here a little bit, uh, a little bit more often. Cool. Um, it's not terribly far away, but you know, it, with no traffic, it's an hour drive. That's what GPS said. It really took us what about an hour and forty to get hour here. Forty five minutes. Yeah. Hour and forty five minutes. Well, it's because so where I live, I live literally on the other side of town. I live. I'm not. You're I'm making not, San Antonio sound like Houston. Well, <laughs> it, it, not quite, but you know, I, where I live is I live east of Highway I-35. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, way down. You know where? I, yeah, like, Congress or yeah, Congress between yeah. Congress and Kirby. Yeah. That's where. That's where. That's where we live. And so, um, uh, it takes a while, and we did take 1604, and that's just a, that's just always a, a traffic jam at, for yeah. rush hour. So, right. Right. Um, but. Uh, you know, I try to help people. We're not like 20 minutes up the road. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, it, hey, I'm going to Benny Branch after this. It's the first time I've ever been there. And oh, I, wow. I've known, oh, I've, I, mean, I, I met Dr. Bob years ago. I, you know, Jennifer works out there. Sure. I've known them all for quite a while. And they're like, you come on by. It's like, it's not like a quick little trip over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you say you're from San Antonio, you know, I kind of just assume you're about 35 minute drive from here. Right? Yeah. And so it, it's every winery in the hill country, it's about an hour and a half from where we live. Mm-hmm. You know, regardless of where they're at. Mm-hmm. Um, even Horseshoe Bay was just about an hour and a half drive. Mm-hmm. It was a little bit longer, about, about an hour and 40. Um, but um, it's all about an hour and a half from where we live. It's literally for us to go anywhere to like have dinner mm-hmm. is a minimum 20 minute drive. Mm-hmm. 
not that there's no restaurants where we live, but they're all like mom and pop. There's gotcha. nothing like larger chain or, or fancier restaurants. It's like a 20 minute drive to go anywhere for us. Just, just, gotcha. to, just to, yeah. So, um, but uh, now that I've been here, now I know where it's at. Um, you know, I'm going to try to get on out here, you know, as often as possible. Oh, cool. Uh, and, well, it's fun. Ch check out some more wines. Um, well, folks, we're just going to do it for now. Um, as always, click the links above to friend me up. I'll have some links uh, below for St. Tree Fund. Also, uh, give farm Farmhouse Vineyards some love. So go to the website to uh, to get the, the links for that. Um, so, pleasure. Hey, pleasure. Thank, you so Thank you so much. much. Yeah, um, and, uh, oh yeah, I didn't say on my other videos the past month. Remember, I have that, I have that referral code for Underground Cellar. It gives me 25 bucks to buy wine from them. <laughs> so, I'll have that down there too. You don't pay me, but you know, hey, it's better than nothing. Uh, anyway, so that's good for now, and we'll see everyone again next time.